So my task is to walk you through first uh, diagnosis and initial treatment of a patient that presented to my clinic. A 55-year-old female with a diagnosis of pH complaining of six months of progressive dyspnea on exertion. She is referred to our clinic from the local provider. So if she came to your clinic referred with a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, uh, what would you do? Her history is that she was diagnosed um, approximately a year ago with a diagnostic echocardiography showing a systolic PA pressure around 48 millimeters of mercury. She did not undergo a right heart catheterization, but for the past six months she has been getting worse. She denies peripheral edema, she has intermittent high, uh, lightheadedness after climbing stairs with exertion, otherwise no real significant limitation. She also has a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Her current medications are listed on the slide with a beta blocker, a mild uh, thiazide diuretic, a PPI, um, a uh, cholesterol lowering medication, and sildenafil 20 milligrams three times a day that she had been uh, on uh, from her local provider. So, the, she comes in with paperwork and it shows the echo report that estimates a systolic PA pressure of 48 millimeters of mercury, an, a normal EF ejection fraction, and no comment on the RV function or size, um, but she carries the diagnosis of PA, the patient carries the diagnosis of PAH based on this in, information. So, ready to vote? Does this patient have PAH? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Did I give you enough information to make the diagnosis? <clears throat> or did she come with enough information to make the correct diagnosis? And you guys are going to tell me when I'm ready. Yes? Dr. McLaughlin, would you be able to make the diagnosis with the information I pre presented? Iwana, what a, what a nice way to start. Um, sadly, there's not enough information there to make a diagnosis. There's an echo from which we have actually not, not very much information at all, an estimated RVS pressure, RVSP, which may or may not be accurate. Sadly, no information on the right ventricle. But as we've said at symposia like this many, many times in the past, you cannot make the diagnosis of PAH without a right heart catheterization. And of course, there's a number of other studies along the diagnostic algorithm that this patient has not had either. So I'm, I would say that the majority of the audience got that correct, at least in my opinion, too. I'm not sure what this yeah, patient yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good educated uh, audience we have here. All right, so let's move on to physical diagnosis. Uh, vital signs are presented here. Um, physical exam, remarkable for presence of jugular venous pressure around 10 millimeters. Um, at 45 degrees, a loud pulmonic component of the second sound, and a mild um, RV lift or um, impulse. Lungs were clear to auscultation, and she had plus one bilateral pitting edema. This is an example of her chest x-ray with very engorged pulmonary arteries um, on both sides, a fl flipped up apical uh, um, um, point of, uh, of, the, of, of the left ventricle, and the lateral showing a retrosternal space that's filled up by the right uh, ventricle that pro it's probably enlarged. So retrosternal space is, is uh, lost, and large, very large pulmonary arteries, and not much uh, pulmonary uh, vascular uh, edema, uh, edema or other parenchymal disorder, um, abnormalities. All right, next question. If you were to conduct one additional test to give you the most information for this, on this patient, which one would you do? A right heart cath, BNP or NT pro BNP, functional class or PFDs? Yes, keep going. Right. Now, we do recognize that we always <clears throat> do a battery of tests in patients who present with unexplained <clears throat> dyspnea 
or with a question of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So although we all need all these tests, which one would give you the most information? All right, so I think uh, uh, the right heart catheterization will give you the most information on the hemodynamics and maybe the diagnosis. So how often, uh, my esteemed colleagues, do you see patients refer to you already on treatment for PAH, but without adequate uh, workup for diagnosis? Rich. Too often. <laughs> Um, I would say that, you know, it's, I think it's gotten better, to be honest, that we still see these patients that were started on empiric therapy with the pH drug without ever having a cath and just based on an echo. Um, I, think, I think it's getting less frequent, but, you know, maybe a quarter of the patients. Okay. Vic, why is the right heart cath that important? Well, I think it's really important. I think that gives us some real definitive objective information. As you all know, when you're looking at an echo, the estimated RV stock pressure and PA pressure, it's, it's an estimate. You, you calculate it with a TR jet, you have to figure out exactly where that, uh, where, where, where you want to calculate it from, plug in the Bernoulli equation. There's other ways to get the PA pressure from the echo, but it's just not that accurate. So I think you can probably make a strong suggestion of pH and maybe even that it might be IPH if you have enough history and a really abnormal echo, but we don't do it. Still the golden rule in pH, you've got to get a right heart cath and make sure you have a real accurate diagnosis. And you want to know the wedge, you want to know the left heart, uh, Left heart data, you want to know the cardiac index, mean RA pressure. If someone calls me about a cath, it's much more important for me to know the mean RA pressure and the cardiac index than it is to know the mean PA pressure. Mean pressure is above 25, it's pH fine. I want to know how bad this patient's, how, how sick they are. Great, so all the numbers in the right heart cath um, are important, not only the PA pressures. So goals of treatment are um, reminded here by the famous table that Dr. McLaughlin um, you know, developed a few years back. And what our current understanding is that anybody who is not in the green box that means that they're not at goal, and then we need to reassess them and, and act on and, and decide how the treatment should be tailored, changed, added on or not, in order to make patients with all the parameters that are associated with better outcome. Because even patients who are here, they have a 5 to 10 percent risk of death at one year, which is not acceptable nowadays in pulmonary hypertension world when we have treatment options. So the echo uh, was repeated and it showed uh, RV enlargement and dysfunction, and she underwent right heart cath, and this is um, the initial cardiac cath results. So let's go over the numbers. A mean PA pressure of 68 over 21 uh, with a mean of 37, a right atrial pressure of six, which was normal, um, a wedge of 24, and the PVR 3.9, calculated at 3.9 woods units. Cardiac output was preserved at 4.1 liters per minute. Okay, so now, should we go back? Because I'm gonna ask you guys what kind of pulmonary hypertension she has. So remember the numbers. A uh, wedge of 24, a mean PA pressure of 37, normal right atrial pressure, and a PVR almost four, normal cardiac output. So what is her type of pulmonary hypertension, PAH? Right heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, left heart disease, not sure. Maybe Dr. Preston, who was scrubbing in, in that, in that uh, video, should redo the hemodynamics because she didn't go, do a good job. All right, so I think the initial diagnosis is uh, correct, oh, Val, what do you think? Well, if you could just go back, Iwana, yes. I just wanna make one teaching point. Yes. Um, this is not physiologically possible. How is that? <laughs> she it caught is. me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the reasons why you always need to 
to think about things so carefully, it's just not physiologically possible to have a wedge pressure that's higher than the pulmonary artery diastolic that pressure. That is absolutely So correct. there's something really fishy there. Of uh, The other things that you should think about, you know, Dr. <laughs> Preston gave you the history, but I didn't hear PND, I didn't hear orthopnea. We talked a little bit about the echo. I didn't hear left atrial enlargement. So you, these are all things that you should be thinking about when you're in that cath. And I don't, the other thing I would say, I would always look at the wedge in relation to the right atrial pressure. So to have an RA of only six with a wedge of 24 would be, although well, no, not impossible, pretty unusual. If the patient had that bad left heart disease, you would probably see a higher right atrial pressure. So I guess, Dr. Preston, we think that maybe you have not adequately trained your fellows yet. Uh, you know, Explain maybe it was July and we were we are all learning. Let's see what we're learning from this case. So at the first glance, this was uh, the diagnosis. This is the uh, PA pressure, the uh, Swan Gans being uh, uh, advanced into the PA. Um, yeah, let me see. Uh, can we can we do the uh, video again? Let's see if we can catch the uh, the wedge, and I'll show you how the wedge is. This is the PA pressure. Well, we did we did re wedge, um, and you uh, Val, you are absolutely right, and Rich, you guys are absolutely right. The initial hemodynamics were not correct. So if you look at these hemodynamics, PA pressure 68 over 22 with a mean of 37, um, RA pressure of six, but the wedge was eight with a more careful um, wedging under fluoroscopy to make sure you get a good waveform. Uh, this was the correct wedge. So now when you calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance, you understand that the uh, um, the disease is much more hemodynamically advanced than the first numbers that <clears throat> I showed you. And then if you can't get a good wedge, of course, you do an LVEP, right? And yeah. if you can't get the wedge or you don't know if the wedge, you, you don't know if the wedge is accurate, the waveform is not quite there, it's really difficult to wedge uh, sometimes, then you do an LVDP. Val? I, I think, so I may be one of the few cardiologists in the room, the only cardiologist in the panel, so I'm allowed to say this. Mm -hmm. um, too, too many cardiologists are really not paying that much attention to hemodynamics. It's a very small proportion of what they do in the cath lab. They spend more time in the coronaries. And I think too many fall into the trap of just letting the computer read things out. And they have that swan in, they see a PA pressure, and then they see a change in waveform, and they say, oh, that's the wedge. But you really need to carefully look at that waveform. More often than not, when you see a mistake like this, it's a damped PA pressure tracing, right. and it doesn't have the nice uh, waveform of a wedge pressure. So Did you I, say it's a damped PA? What did you say? Damped. Oh, damped. 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 I got you. I got you. Um, <laughs> You know, so I think you want to mention some of the other tricks, you know, sort of looking under fluoro, seeing how much you're moving. You can deflate and inflate the balloon a little bit. You can get a wedge sat to see if your sat is high enough that that's pulmonary venous blood as opposed to pulmonary arterial blood. There's lots of things you can do to see if that's a good tracing, but then, of course, as Vic said, if you're still not sure or it doesn't make sense with the case, you measure an LVEDP, and in the absence of really three things, mitral stenosis, core triatriatum, and pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, the LVEDP and wedge should be equal. Great. So let's wrap up the uh, official uh, diagnosis for this patient. Uh, Rich. I mean, the patient has PAH, so it's with scleroderma. Um, we are looking at Obviously, the final testing, VQ scan PFTs, which are normal, so the patient doesn't have CTAF, and that's an important point. Even a patient with known connective tissue disease, a risk factor for PAH, they can still have CTAF. <clears throat> so you can't stop the workup saying this is a scleroderma patient with PAH. You need the other testing, and scleroderma patients can have ILD. And then those other, the top three tests are a way to risk stratify with BMP elevated, <clears throat> six minute walk being somewhat reduced for goal, and then functional class two. So as a reminder, 
while right heart cath is crucial for the diagnosis of PAH and for the differential diagnosis of other PAH, all other non-invasive tests add on to understand the severity of this patient. And her New York Heart, uh, heart Association functional class was two. She underwent a six-minute walk test. A BNP, the VQ scan, was ruled out. Chronic thromboembolic pH and pulmonary function tests were not within normal limits. And again, to remind you that our goal for treating this patient is to have her um, have all risk factors of high increased mortality and morbidity shift towards a better outcome in the green box. Mm -hmm.